welcome to Beers and Biscuits, a dog cast for the rest of us. I'm Karen. And I'm Nicole. Grab a beverage, give your dog a biscuit, and enjoy the conversation. So tonight we have the lovely Ashley Hyatt coming to share her story about her dog Bungie. Yeah. And this is going to be a good one. This is one that I'm actually, well, I'm, I've been very excited about all of them, but I'm really excited to dive into this one because there's a lot that we covered. So Ashley is a teacher. Her husband is also an educator. They are big fans of traveling. They are first time dog guardians and they welcomed a deaf dog into their home for their first dog how right. amazing is that it, it is truly amazing what, to, like, like take that plunge yeah, right absolutely like, i'm gonna go for it uh ashley is going to be sharing her story and we're going to dive into it what we want to emphasize the most and we're going to talk a little bit about before we bring in the episode <laughs> is going into this one with grace and kind of leave some of your gut reactions at the door. Right. And I think, but let's just, let let me me get your take before I start (laughs) waxing too poetic here. Oh, I love it. I love that language, waxing (laughs) poetic. I love it. Um, So, yeah, so... I think this is going to maybe hit people a little differently. And that is because we are interviewing Ashley and she's wonderful. Um, and yes. Her dog is beautiful and wonderful. And she's a, a, a friend of Heidi who was on our season one. So we have to go into this with a little extra self-awareness i guess of how we perceive and how we take in information and how we process that information and leaving the judgment behind because it's a really hard topic for me see i don't even want to say that because she she does do a lot of positive reinforcement and force free stuff but because bungee is deaf she is using the e-collar to help with that. Um, and so I think for me, it this was really very personal to me, right? Because I wanted to challenge myself to not be judgmental. And if anybody knows me, <laughs> I mean, we don't even need any... to finish that sentence right so if anybody need... knows me and i try not to be right i try not right. to be right. um but i think it's really important and it's an important conversation and i'll and this is why i feel that way because as trainers as advocates for not only dogs but guardians i think that we have to give guardians more grace and i think that we have to make sure that guardians no matter where they are at in their journey whether their journey is aligned with ours or their journey you know is gonna intersect with ours at some point we have to be okay meeting them where they are at in their journey and Making sure that they don't feel judged about that. Making sure that they have the total, utmost support of their trainer. And I think that that's a lot of times is hard, right? When you're so entrenched and you're so like viscerally just, I guess, yeah, this viscerally entrenched in force-free positive reinforcement methods, not every client that you get is going to be there. And it's not to say that 
you have to change all of your clients, right? I mean, yeah, I would love for everybody to just be like, I worked with a, a trainer and now I am off my prong collar, but that's not always realistic. And so I feel like as trainers, we can't negate where the guardian is at. And so we have to be more open to hearing and understanding and working with and guiding guardians that maybe aren't on the same path that we are on. Absolutely, because I think one of the things that, and I think I'm pretty sure I even said it during the course of this, is that it just feels like we as a society have forgotten how to have conversations with right. people that we disagree with without yelling or calling names or anything like that. And that's where the real disconnect is coming from. And that's why I'm, I'm really excited about this episode because we have to remember Ashley is a guardian. Ashley is not a certified professional dog trainer. She's working towards that. She would love to become a dog trainer. But right. she is a guardian doing the best with the knowledge she has at this time. And I think that sometimes gets lost in the conversation on social media. And we just assume that because somebody is posting online their journey, they're an expert, you know? And we, right. we forget that we all start somewhere. We all work towards being better, whatever that looks like. But it's just, for me, it was really important to have the conversation and actually have a conversation and not just delve into pushing the agenda and right. not hearing exactly. the other person's side. That, exactly. Exactly. And I think well, I like to think we did a good job of having a conversation and not pushing the agenda. Yeah. And I think too, I think we get so bogged down sometimes with this idea that if we don't openly push this quote unquote agenda, I hate using the word agenda because it's just got such a negative connotation, but. But at the but, same time, e-callers have a negative connotation. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a fine word to use. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. But I think the problem for me, and this is just me personally, mm -hmm. is that I feel like sometimes if I am not openly saying something, right? If I'm not openly saying I wouldn't use this or I wouldn't do it that way, that it feels like condoning that in some way. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I know that I can help someone. I can help a guardian and a dog affect some positive change, even if they never stop the, using the equipment they're using. I know that I can do that. And I feel like maybe that's sometimes the thing that's missing. I do know plenty of trainers that won't even take clients that use aversive equipment or, or um, trainers that will drop clients right? Um, for our walking company, we don't use any aversives. That doesn't mean that if somebody uses aversives on their own, that we're not going to walk their dog. Um, you know, and I try to be as educational about that as possible, but the, I don't need to change everything about somebody. I can help them without forcing the issue and trying to change somebody does that make sense yeah i, I think that makes that makes perfect because and i feel like that's kind of what we've been we've been saying to you that like we just have to stop screaming at each other you may feel right. like that's what the two sides are doing i think that's all 
they're doing right now. And I, I also feel like I am maybe in a little bit of a different place than you right now. Like I'm kind of just like a little disenchanted with this industry because like I kind of see it a little bit differently from you where you're saying like you feel kind of like you have to say something. I feel right. like I obviously if somebody is coming to me and saying I want help that's when I will say something otherwise because like I used to on my social media I used to post a lot of like a lot like a lot a lot of hate towards these products and yes every once in a while I will make a funny little reel about not using a prong (laughs) collar right but I had people who were following me who used these products and they were like, I'm not going to follow you anymore because this isn't helpful. This is just, this feels like you're attacking. Right. And I listened to that. I, and like, look, at the end of the day, it's also, it's not about like who's following you. I like, I don't care. You want to stop following me? That's fine. But it was, you know what? You're right. If I'm just stuck here screaming essentially that's what i was doing every day about how terrible these products are but i'm not doing enough to show you how to get off of it then i'm not any better than the people who are out there doing the same thing saying force free doesn't do anything and you have to use these tools so that kind of changed my approach to things and i just now share force free and the good it does right and i put that message out versus always feeling like i have to say something about these tools because that because again like when i see a trainer out there who is a balance trainer and their reels are excuse me shitting on force free i just scroll i go nope I'm not, look, I I don't want to, you're not going to teach me anything here. Right. And then I was like, okay, so then I'm doing the same thing effectively. If I'm saying this doesn't work and I'm not, you know, like that's all I'm doing. So I had to change my way of doing it. I feel like I took a left here and I apologize. Let's get back. No, no, I think it's (laughs) great. I think it's great. I think, you know, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing you saying is that you had to course correct a little bit. and understand that you can't always just be fighting you have to also be educating yeah and and not keep fighting back and forth and and i agree um I think where I'm at, and I am also disenchanted, obviously, because I retired, (laughs) Um, (laughs) but, um, you know, I, I do feel like I've softened a little bit because I feel so deeply for the guardians, Mm -hmm. right? And so I don't ever want a guardian to feel shamed or to feel judged or to feel unheard just because they're using a piece of equipment. Now, if you are calling yourself a trainer and you are taking somebody's money and you are giving somebody else advice or instruction. I'm not going to have the same level of non-judgment for you because I feel like but I feel like that's we should be able to have a discourse about that. Whereas I want to be more helpful and listen more and be open more to the guardians that are in the middle of this fight, I guess, for lack of a better yeah. word. Yeah. And again, like I'm not disagreeing with you i just see it a little bit differently because i see on social media like somebody will post something and then and again this is all just like perspective because it, it it's i don't act like i'm just seeing what's on my phone you know i don't actually know 
much deeper than that. But to right. me, it feels like in those situations, the roles kind of get reversed. And we're not force free in those moments. And we become what we're right. fighting against. And I feel like there is a way to have that discourse that you're talking about, but I just don't feel like it's in the comments of somebody's minute and a half long post on social media. Right. You're so you're so much a better person than I am. <laughs> no, so, I don't um... know. I just I I think that's just how it feels to me that I feel like and, and look, they do the same thing. The balance people come into our comment section. And they'll lead with the negative reinforcement and the positive right. punishment stuff. So, like, I'm not saying we're better or they're worse or whatever. It goes both ways. But I think if we really want to put forth the force-free and the positive reinforcement idea, we also have to do that to human beings. Because I've seen so many times the balanced community will say that, that we're not force free when it comes to talking to them and mm. i have to agree with them because like i said we're not going to make change if we're just yelling at each other back and forth in comments right if we can have a conversation that's different and we can we can make those comments with the best of intentions but again it's that perception and that person reading it may not take it the way we intended and then we are getting into these keyboard warrior fights and then right we're back to square one you know right get out of my head karen this <laughs> uh, no i think you're right i think you're right and that's i mean that's from you know me a i mean it's a hard pill to swallow right because to feel so passionately about something and not have an impassioned response to it yeah. is hard, right? So I try to, when I see these things happen, and I've been trying a lot to not comment on things, um, and I've, not, I've been doing pretty good. <laughs> I mean, until the past couple of days when I was- When you when got- when I, <laughs> I got suspended from Instagram. So <laughs> oh, yeah, you're doing so great. You're I know, I was. So well. <laughs> but the funny thing is, is that the comment that got me suspended was, was me, so offering, nice. me offering free help to a guardian. It was the <laughs> nicest comment. It was so nice. <laughs> I guess it's just my track, my track record. So they're so like, okay, forget it. Like, she's, yeah. she's commented enough. Um, but yeah, I mean, I do catch myself sometimes. And I would rather, you know, if somebody's going to attack, I, I'm, I'm not going to just acquiesce to oh, just acquiesce. I, right? you know, I'm, not, I'm not a saint over here. There are times where I'm like, <laughs> I'm typing away going full Karen. And I'm like, no. <laughs> so, yeah, we're not just going to like stand by and let it happen. Right. <laughs> right. There are, you know, there are those times where I feel like, okay, there's a glimmer here where this person isn't necessarily coming at me mm -hmm. and I can probably have a decent conversation offline with this person and so I do really try to do that first oh you absolutely know, hey, yeah. I'll I'll dm them and be like hey if you really want to you know talk about this I'd be happy to have a discussion with you and you know outside of all of the noise that's happening in that post and I try to do that a lot um it's very rarely successful um however i do i am trying to do that versus to just react in the comments um but i also look i also <laughs> look at, at the, the commenter first and if they are a guardian and they are not promoting themselves as a trainer absolutely my first thing is to offer them help yeah. Right. Just to say, hey, DM me. I'm I'm more than willing to to help you or to, you know, help you find someone for free. There are people that charge for that service, but I'll no, help you for free to locate somebody in your area or to, you know, to what have you. Um, 
but it's hard. It's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard sometimes. Yeah. So I just, I, I really hope that when people listen to this episode, they'll first and foremost remember that Ashley is a guardian. Right. She is a guardian doing her very best for her very, very lovely, sweet dog. And I think it's important that we listen to the story right. and her reasons and go into this with that empathy and that grace and just take that away from this episode. Yeah. I mean, I thought she, I thought that she was great and I felt... I felt a little bit renewed after talking with her. Um, and I don't think that, I don't think it detracts from her guardianship in any way. Does that make, I don't know. I hate to say Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Agreed. And I think she is the perfect person to share this story. Right. And her views on it because she's so open about it. You know, looking for ways to improve her training. Right. But like you said, Bungie has a beautiful life. Probably, <laughs> probably a better life than most of us. Because <laughs> you know, you're traveling and right? going to Mexico and all these great places. <laughs> um, so I think... I'm so glad that she trusted us with her story. And with right. I hope that we we bring justice to that, you know, I hope we do it well. Exactly. Or share it well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think um no, I don't think that we really went off on a tangent here, but um this is by no means the entirety of our episode. We did cover a lot of great things with Ashley, and I'm very happy that we had her on to share her story, um, which I think is going to be really beneficial for all guardians um, and definitely new guardians, um, first time dog guardians, I think will really benefit from ashley's story all right well what do you think i think it's time that we let ashley tell her story welcome welcome so tonight our guest is ashley and she is a wonderful artist i actually have her instagram page up right now and i'm looking at it and i'm like i want one of those i want one of those <laughs> um, she is a dog guardian we are so excited to talk with tonight and share her story so we are just excited to have you with us tonight ashley welcome did you do you want to introduce yourself a little bit more than that Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful so we're going to start off like we always do with the with the hardest questions the the worst ones <laughs> to get them out of the way our favorite icebreaker question so my first one for you is if you could eliminate one food so that no one would ever eat it ever again which food would you pick to destroy? Well, for me personally, I would go with spicy food. Okay. Very low spice tolerance. Yeah. Is there like a specific spicy food or just in general? I mean, it's all of them. <laughs> <laughs> no bring on the spice bring on the really? spice really yes yes i love spicy food yep the hotter like the better a little a little bit but i have to say i'm probably with ashley on this one nicole i'm sorry i want to be like i mean not on on every meal or every piece oh, yeah. of food but like, if I'm going for hot and spicy, I want to be borderline crying. 
<laughs> like, I want to feel it. Like, if I'm going for it, I want to feel it. But I I do like spice. A lot of spice, yep. I'm okay on the bland side of life. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my, my next icebreaker, apparently, apparently I was hungry when I was coming up with your icebreaker questions. So is cereal a soup? Why or why not? <laughs> okay. Um, I guess Karen. I'd say, I guess I'd say no. Okay. Um, but now you've got me thinking about it. Right. And exactly. And I'd say no because I've never had soup for breakfast. But I guess okay. you could. But I mean, you had cereal for dinner. Yeah, for yes. sure. Of course. Yeah, yeah. I'd say it doesn't have enough veggies in it. Okay. Good answer. Right. Good yeah. answer. That's a I good way to... I would say <laughs> you're not cooking your cereal in the in the milk. First of all, milk. Gross. But you're not, like, making, like, cooking a batch of cereal in the milk and then serving but technically... it. technically cereal is cooked it's cereal is like the frosted flakes or the like it doesn't magically become cereal when you pour the milk in it Cere- i mean it kind of does re- it kind of does ar- <laughs> it's already <laughs> cereal when it's in the box like you know so you do, yeah. cook, you do have to cook it you have to process it so i'm i'm a no on this one i'm a no i'm a hard no i think you've survived I think you made it through okay. the <laughs> hardest the part. One, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you you made it. <laughs> I love that like I'm finding people are like so nervous about our icebreaker questions. Yeah. And I feel like I probably shouldn't be like finding as much joy in that as I do. But I also feel like that means we're doing a good job breaking the right ice. say our questions are pretty good i mean yeah. they're you know they're kind of a little obscure some you know a little funny but we really get to the the meat of the issues with our icebreaker <laughs> questions now that we've established here cereal is not a soup we can all <laughs> we can all agree that we've come to the meat of that question <laughs> <laughs> wonderful so ashley there is no pressure here but you were brought to us by heidi who has our highest listened to episodes so far so let's let's get into oh, it heidi. nicole do you want to kick us off or do you want me to yeah no let me start um so Ashley, thank you so much, first of all, for writing such an amazing little like piece about you and your background and, um, you know, kind of how you got to, to where you and Bungie, right? Bungie mm-hmm. yep, are at today. Um, but I'd like to, to go back a little bit. Um, so your background is in education. Mm -hmm. So for listeners and for guardians out there, um, how do you feel that your background in education helped kind of this journey with Bungie? It kind of helps in like seeing what she needed and kind of coming up with plans to address it. So the Bungie is a deaf Australian cattle dog. Um, So she already sort of came to us just with a different way of learning and approaching her world. Um, And then as, you know, things came up in her training. Well, I guess let me start that over. The um, having a background in education sort of gave Cole and I, my husband also was a teacher. um, I feel like kind of a step up from 
having no dog experience as far as like um setting her up for success sort of planning what to teach her and how to teach her and like scaffolding her learning um, right and breaking it up into steps and motivating her and then when things didn't when she had challenges or when things you know didn't go the way we expected and like analyzing those behaviors and um coming up with like next step plans based on actually like taking data on her I have to say, like, I'm very envious of my friends who are teachers who then come into the dog training world because I'm just like, I wish I had your knowledge of, like, just lesson plans, like, how to, like, properly come up with it and not just, like, swimming through it trying to figure it out because that alone right there, that's a, that's a skill. I mean, even problem solving, right? Because I mean, I mean, I only know from doing like a pre-practicum once semester as in high school biology. And after that, I was like, F this. Um, So, (laughs) but I mean, you know, you can't really go into it all the time with expecting every student, every child to learn the same way or receive information the same way even. Um, and so I feel like even that skill of learning how to take this piece of information that you need everybody to absorb and maybe having to deliver that differently sometimes to, you know, certain students, um, or even just, you know, approaching their learning style differently, um, I feel like that would be super beneficial too. Yeah, I think um I think also it I taught first grade for the majority of my time teaching. So never assuming like that they know anything that you haven't explicitly taught them. And then like if there's something that you want to teach them, thinking about every step like involved in that process and in that process and teaching them like sequentially um and building up on them. Like, I would never teach it. I would never just expect a kid to go on the computer without teaching them how to use, like, a mouse, you know, or how to, like, log in to, like, their extra math or whatever, like, right. program they're doing. Like, you've got to teach each of the steps. So, like, you know, with, with Bungie taking her, I mean, she's got, she had, um, she's got a lot of reactivity and we had to do a lot of, like, desensitizing the things and she was very sensitive to touch. So, like, I would never think of like taking her to the park before I taught her how to get into the car in our driveway. Um, and I, you know, before that is how to walk out of the door and like wait at the door. Right. So it's just like each step in the process so that she can keep um, like a level of composure, not a level of composure, but like below the threshold um, to be able to be successful. Right. Well, and I think that right there is something your average dog guardian doesn't stop to think of. And that's, and I'm not trying to shade any dog guardian that didn't know, but that that's a huge leg up right there. I mean, I think that's just how, how we're so conditioned to approach things, right? Like, I mean, we're so conditioned to be like, well, if I know it, then, Everyone knows it, you know, just because I, you know, I can do something. A lot of times it's, it does take that active, like conscious effort to be like, okay, I know it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you know it or understand it at the level that I do. And so I need to dial that back. And like what Ashley's saying is, teach that in steps and we we want each step in that process to be successful and and build on each other um and i think that is sometimes just it just doesn't come naturally i think in this relationship with our our pets Absolutely. I feel like we kind of are 
we come into these relationships with our dogs with so many expectations and we put that on our dog and we expect them to be able to just go to the park or just get in the car or whatever it may be. But we really need to be looking at taking that step back and teaching them how to do these things. Yeah. So going back a little bit, tell us a little bit about Bungie's history and some of the things that you've had to work through um, and what you're still working, working through or working on. Yeah, it's, it's always a work in progress. Um, so she, she's from Texas. She was found kind of just wandering around as a solo four ish month old pup. Um, and you know, she got connected with a rescue and then sent up here and we adopted her up here. Um, we knew she was deaf when we adopted her. Um, and we were kind of like excited for that challenge. Um, but neither of us, neither of us have had dogs before. She's our first. Um, so, and kind of over the first couple of weeks we had her, some like, behaviors and anxieties started to show um she was a I mean she came to us kind of as like a a compulsive dinner um but she you know she had a lot of anxieties and reactivity that sort of came to the front um and then she got really sensitive to touch um so that like for a big chunk of the first winter that we had her all of our communication was through sign language. Like I didn't really touch her at all. Um, And she's a really, she's a really quick learner and teaching her sign language was like a cakewalk. Um, She picks up on things pretty quick, but the, um, the working through like, how do we go places without like touching her? How do we do A, B, C, D without, any physical contact and how do we like make her feel okay without like being able to talk to her and using Hmm. like our voice to like you know connect or like using touch it was just like sort of it was a big learning curve but a really cool challenge um and because everything was so hard for her like finding a place to just like enjoy each other's company and find joy without like it being work was also really important in building the relationship um and for us that place was the woods so so like we each day we would we would train we would train a good amount um but we would also just spend time in the woods together Um, and she was really like recall training was she picked up on it really quick Um, so probably within, we got at the end of November, probably by like April, she was like, good, like, I, I was comfortable (laughs) with, with having her off leash. I mean, we started in like, probably February doing like bits of it, the end of February, but mostly like, I think by April she was good off leash in the woods like with solid recall yeah so that was kind of like the space where we connected and built our relationship oh i'm kind of ranting <laughs> no no you're keep doing, going you're doing, yeah you're doing great but, but yeah so it's we've just kind of like grown together and learned how to learn from each other oh. so one of our one of our big challenges early on was Cole and I are um, pretty committed, like, through travelers. So, and we're both teachers. So, we'd go on, like, big trips during the summer. Um, like, you know, riding our bike in Canada to Mexico or whatnot. But the um, the summer after we got bungee, we were planning on paddling the Northern Forest Canoe Trail, which is the 700 40 mile trip from the Adirondacks to like the tip top of Maine. And so, and we were planning on bringing Bungie and we thought like, we got this winter, you know, <laughs> we can get all that <laughs> training and it'll be great. 
<laughs> and she was good. Like we ate our meals in the canoe in the yard. We did like practiced everything that we thought we'd have to do for that trip. We practiced being in the tent in the house, being outside in the dark was kind of hard, but um, once we put those together and took her camping like in town, it was a it was a disaster. <laughs> she couldn't handle it it was really sad um but just like putting all those things together was too much so we actually spent the next three the three months leading up to our trip sleeping in our tent in our house that's commitment Uh, yeah Mm -hmm. and it works (laughs) but again like that was a hard one to train because when the lights are out we can't communicate right she doesn't like touch um and she also like she's she's pretty snappy um and she snaps at hands because that's how we communicate um so and she sorry i'm listing all these things that are like no you're doing so good (laughs) dog i love her (laughs) but um she also sleep startles so like sharing space is hard right I mean, look, if we're being honest, I probably sleep startle too. Like if Neil touches me while we're sleeping, like just no, get away from me. So, and I, I think he still loves me. So she's a good dog. I get it. I, I, (laughs) and she's every night now, she's my little spoon and it's so great. But if I want to roll over, I have to like ask Cole to like move over so I can move without like bumping her. (laughs) I mean, I love that though. I love that though, that, that, I mean, it goes beyond commitment. Right. I mean, we can be committed to things, but it's it's like another deeper level of love, I think, that we're willing to not necessarily sacrifice, but to change the way we view things and the way that we see things. And I feel like, you know, what a testament to you guys, you know, you're going to go on this trip and you 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 know, you thought you were prepared and then you did this like little trial run and it didn't work. And I feel like most of us, myself included, would be like, okay, well, I guess we're just not, she's just not a traveling dog, you know? And it would be more of like, okay, well now how do we find people to be able to watch her for us or, you know, and it's, I feel like it's that level of understanding. I think it's also Karen, just, Karen knows it. She's in my head. I, like you were saying, I think it's a, it's a commitment. It's a love. It's an understanding. But it's also a, sometimes we need somebody who's just going to push us over, not in a bad way. We're not shoving anybody off a cliff, but just help us <laughs> over that little hum to show us that we can do it and sometimes that's the hardest step to acknowledge that like okay you may not like this now but I know in the long run this is something you can enjoy and that is not to say that it's the same thing for every dog some dogs won't enjoy the traveling but to acknowledge that this dog in front of me I believe you will enjoy this so I'm going to help you overcome your trepidation it's it's the ultimate act of love to help somebody like that and not just let them sit in that fear well and at great cost to you I mean who yeah you know what I mean? Who wants to sleep in a tent in their yeah. house for, you know, for months? I mean, come on. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's 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 that level of I'm okay with giving up a little bit of this because I feel like it's going to have these this grander impact on our relationship together, being able for us to enjoy these things that obviously you enjoy, you enjoy being out in nature and you enjoy traveling. And, you know, if we, if we look at, and and for me too, I enjoy traveling. Like the, what I want is I want to be able to enjoy that with Peter. So 
I I'm willing to change things up a little bit in my own comfort zone or my own comfort level so that I can enjoy these loves and these passions with my dog because that's ultimately why I got him. Like why I have him is to share those things. And so I, you know, I feel like that's a piece sometimes that we're either too quick to be like, it didn't work or, you know, to, I don't know, to not approach it in a, in a bigger way, I guess. Yeah. With, with B, I feel like it's kind of about giving her the space to a- approach something at her pace. Um, like, like the tent, I didn't, I mean, like, yes, I spent time with her in it, but like at night, we never made her come in. I never told her to do anything. I just left the door open and gave her the option. And like, she had a hard time with that option for a while, but like she came to it when she was ready. And like, she's kind of learned how to share right. space with us at her pace, like over the two years that we had her um, right. and everything with her, like her learning is kind of like that, like giving her the space to approach it her way. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's a lot of a lot of the pieces that are missing sometimes right is not allowing for that little extra bit of agency to allow them to work through these things at their own pace you know i mean you would probably have a much different relationship if after that first little time It didn't work. And you were like, well, we're just going to do it anyway, you know, but taking that step back and allowing that time. And again, that commitment and that change for you guys to be able to give her that space and that time to do that on her own. I think it's just, we just miss that. We miss that piece so often. I was super insightful. It was my, like my. Yes. Thank you for that contribution, Karen. My two cents there was really <laughs> scientifically thought out and, yep. you know, write that in like the Guinness Book of World Records for most. We're just going to call this episode big time. <laughs> no, I've been writing things down, um, but okay. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Ashley, where Karen loses her mind 46 times an episode. Um, it is the same sense. <laughs> because the meds are not at the right level. Um, okay, so I want to go back <laughs> one moment, please. Um, because I feel like we've kind of glossed over something a little bit. And I just want you to kind of share a little bit about maybe how you I don't know the right way to phrase this question because I don't know. Um, But so how you guys came to the conclusion or the acceptance or just like the decision to adopt a deaf dog. Um, I had never really wanted a dog. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair. That's fair. I never, I mean, I didn't really have, many connections with dogs growing up um and you know it seemed like a lot of work (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and I I never wanted an untrained dog um but then when I left teaching and had this life where now I was more available for one I told Cole like yeah okay we can look at a dog because he always wanted one um and then we went and looked at B, and so I'm like, yeah, I, I feel like, that. I don't know. It was kind of like, he really wanted one. And I was like, okay, yeah, we can do this. Um, and then we just, and, and the deafness didn't really, like, it, it wasn't a deterrent at all. We thought it would be kind of cool to learn to communicate right. 
with a with a dog using ASL and and it is really cool and then we've started learning ASL on our own now so <laughs> so I don't know it's I mean we like learning and it was we felt up for the challenge and I'm I love that I never ever feel the urge to yell at my dog like I find that I have to like purposely like we're out, if we're out on trails and I recall her I have to remind myself to say it like if there's another dog I have to remind myself to say it out loud because if I don't the other person doesn't realize and then I have to quickly like cut these recall short to turn her around so she doesn't get startled by a dog mm-hmm. on like her back end because that's the more sensitive side you know right yeah um so yeah, I just, she, it wasn't really like, it was just part of her when we decided to adopt her. I love that. I love that it wasn't a, it wasn't a deal breaker and it also wasn't like a, this is like you were just accepting of who she is. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of the, it's kind of the, I mean, for a first time owner, or guardian, rather, cut that first time guardian. It's kind of the trifecta of you, a deaf dog, which is going to require some more skills on your part, more savvy for sure, and learning how to navigate that. But then you also have a healer. Mm-hmm. And also a dog with reactivity. Mm-hmm. So it's not only that, you know, you just walked into and decided that, like, yeah, this is a challenge that we're ready for. You also have these other challenges that compound that. It was and you really experience. leaned into the experience. So. Right. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I kind of feel like... I I love that she's deaf, and I kind of feel like I would always want a deaf dog. I mean, that's like I said, awesome. Yeah. That's so awesome, honestly. We foster now, too. And part of the fostering, like, is to help Bungie, like, with her flexibility also. Like, she's, she's at, at first, she was like, no other dogs in the house. And we've made so much progress with that. And then now she, like, welcomes them in pretty well. Um, But it's, like, she's – again, I went on a tangent. No, (laughs) keep going. Keep going. Um, But but I brought the fosters up because, like, now I've spent time training a deaf dog and hearing dogs. Um, And the training's really the same. Like it, it, it doesn't, and I teach the hearing dog sign language too, um, which is really cool because when they leave us, they know like a whole bunch of different cues, verbal or nonverbal, which is really neat. Love it. Um, and, and I teach in the ASL so that Bungie like knows what's going on. Um, but yeah, the, the training isn't really any different. I forgot kind of where I was going. <laughs> but, uh, so the com the compounding factors then of i mean i would be hard pressed to recommend a healer in general for a first-time dog owner just i mean a lab maybe uh-huh. we'll toss just some doodles but oh, i mean not a doodle <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I mean, sorry, I have you big know, feelings about them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the same with with any really, you know, kind of working type dog. I mean, there's a lot and there's a lot that we don't necessarily think about in terms of meeting their needs or, you know, integrating them into maybe an environment that they're not hundred percent really suited for Mm -hmm. even just dogs I mean rescue dogs in general myself having had a couple of rescues from you know down south or you know there's a very vast 
difference between a dog having spent a couple of months in puppyhood on, you know, a ranch somewhere. And then now you're up in kind of Boston. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. surprise, <laughs> nothing like what you started out with. Um, so, I mean, I think that even that in general, just for any guardian adopting a dog from a completely different environment, you know, so you have that as well. And then this reactivity piece on top of it and handling that, all of those things together compounds for sure. I mean, I'm glad we I'm glad we jumped in the deep end because there was no way of ever getting away with being lazy about it. Um, and I don't think we really would have anyway, but like, like she's a dog that we have to meet her needs and we have to train her. And like, like that's, there's not an option there. Right. See, like in a way, I like this. I like you, Ashley. I like it. You're like, fuck this. <laughs> Going all in. I'm going, give me the hardest one. Even if it wasn't like a subconscious or if, even if it was like a conscious decision, I like it. But the only reason I like it is because you are the right person for this. Because there are people out there that would be like, oh, I want a deaf dog because it would be fun to do this. And then they get it and they realize the challenges, maybe not the best way to put it, but the challenges of having a dog with special needs. And then they just give up on it. But I like that, mm. again, you didn't look at this as a deal breaker or, you know, you weren't searching for this, but you accepted that this is who this dog is and you work every day to make this dog's life better. So right. I, I like you, Ashley. Thanks. I mean, everything <laughs> that we do all day with her, like, because I'm, I'm, I work from home. So like everything is training for her. Um, there's a lot of relaxation training. There's a lot of stuff. Right. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so one thing I was thinking as you were talking about kind of kinesthetic awareness and sensitivity there, mm-hmm. and also the reactivity piece, do you think either of those really is kind of a byproduct of being deaf um is the reactivity and sensitivity a byproduct of being deaf i think the deafness kind of enhances some of those um because like she she startles really easy right um and like if she doesn't see something coming like she startles from it. Um, so I think that definitely is increased because of the deafness. I think the reactivity probably would have been there anyway. Um, I think sometimes I think sometimes the deafness helps it because she misses things. Right. Like she's great in thunderstorms. Um, and fireworks. <laughs> um, as long as she's not watching them. But yeah, I I feel like it's kind of hard to separate the two. Like it's all sort of wrapped up in who she is. So. Right. Um, but the sensitivity, like when things approach from the back end, is hard. For her. Right. I mean, and that would that would mean you too. You know, you touching her. So is she well, is I, she I don't, from the so, back. So e- so even now, like mm-hmm. there's no way. Like you're not just ever gonna walk up to her and like scratch her bum a little bit no no um she the mornings are like her lovey time um we can touch her after she does her morning stretches and then she comes and asks for it and then we give her you know head scratches and whatever she wants um and then i really i don't touch her unless she asks for it nice Um, it's a little bit more of that agency going on there yeah yeah it's uh it's hard around other people who are used to dog just petting a dog you know (laughs) um there's a lot of just like it to pet her (laughs) 
um, which I had I had to get used to more like advocating for her. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the concept of a friendly dog who doesn't want to be touched is a really hard one for a lot of people um, because she's like she's got some really good qualities for a healer. Like she loves visitors. And she loves when people comes over, she'll go, she'll wiggle next to them, and then she'll go get her ball and do whatever she wants. Like, <laughs> it's not, <laughs> she doesn't want the pets. And if, if she asks for it, she wants it for two seconds, um, which is a hard concept. So we usually just say no. Uh, but but that, that, was, that was one of the hardest things for me to kind of like wrap my head around and like, commit to saying no matter what because she does give like a mixed message there right if you don't know like her signals and her body language I feel like working with cats a little bit I feel like (laughs) it's hard like a cat yeah (laughs) like I I even I'm trying to help my parents who adopted a cat recently and they just having owned cats for years and years and years. I mean, since even before I was born, so lots of decades. Um all have always had cats that were very affectionate. And this one is like, hmm. I mean, I'll come up to you and I'll rub on you, but I don't really want you to touch me. And so there's that big learning curve there. You know, and I feel like even more so with dogs, right? Because there there is kind of this unwritten like thing about cats. Cats are just, you know, I do what I want to do. But the devil. they are the devil. No. I can't say that. I I love my cat. But he he was the devil for a really long time because I didn't really I mean, I understood that, right? As a trainer and behavior person, I understood that I needed to allow him to express what he wanted, but it took me a long time to understand how to make that available to him so that we were communicating, you know, we were, we were reading the same book and we were on the same page, you know? So it was like, I had to learn what that I don't want to say consent, but it is consent. What that consent looked like for him and how to read that better. And so I feel like for dogs, we're just, I don't understand. And it's, it's utterly a, like an American thing. I think having been to other countries where every dog is your dog, you're walking down the street and they're all your dogs to go pet and love and get up in their face. It's like, it's, it's weird. It's a weird concept to me. So I can imagine that that's, you know, the advocating for her peace takes a lot and probably takes a lot out of you. Yeah. Cause there's like, there's an expect expectation of what she should be like. And, and that's not her. Um, she's very different. And that's okay. And that's cool. Um, And we kind of, you know, had to build, like, how our relationship, how we communicate in our relationship and, you know, come up with not, not rules, but like, well, kind of like rules of trust, you know, like, she knows I'm not gonna pet her unless she asks for it. Right, And she knows, like, if I need to get in the bed or on the couch, I'm going to tell her to get it off first, and then I'm going to get there, and then she can come back on in her spot. Otherwise, you know, she would get snappy. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there's predictability there, too. You know what I mean? And I think that that breeds a level of trust, too, that they – that you bring a level of predictability to your behavior as well that can help her feel more comfortable and more trusting of you. I feel like part of it is like looking at her, she's an adorable dog. She's based on 
pictures. She's on the smaller side. So, and she's got those mixed cues that you say. So people are always going to just be like, oh, it's fine. It's fine. Versus when it's a German Shepherd or a Rottweiler or whatever it is. And people are like, please don't pet my dog. He's not nice. They go, oh, okay. Versus this cute little thing. Oh, it's fine. And so that's got to be, like you guys were saying, incredibly frustrating to always have to be like, for the love of God, do not touch my dog. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I, I just don't understand why we all have this sense of entitlement when it comes to other people's dogs. I mean, I mean, I don't. Oh, gosh, but, no, I, I don't mean... think any, I don't, I don't think any oh, of really? us here on this podcast do, but I'm talking about, like, the general... Public. Yeah. I've I've actually had somebody ask me that before. Don't you want to pet my dog? And I'm like, well, it's your dog. Like, yeah. I'm a I'm a random stranger walking through the store. Like, yeah, your dog is super cute, but I'm not gonna just like come in and start, you know, invading space. Right. But yeah, I mean it is it does take a level of advocating again for you, Ashley, on multiple levels. So, you know, even a reactive dog that isn't deaf, you're going to have to advocate for people to give you space and to, you know, not be all dogs love me, Frank. But even now with the not being able to hear things piece, if you're a you know a second or two behind or you know whatever like you're just having a moment and you're not 100% on top of it other dogs would be able to hear that person and so even though they might be reactive at least they have some knowledge that that person is coming whereas she doesn't And so that's even more pressure on you to be like, I have got to be, I have got to be on it all the time. Like, I can't take a second to like, stop and tie my shoe if there's a lot of people around or, you know, God forbid, blow my nose if there's a lot, you know, if there's a lot happening because you have to be on it. And again, like kudos, kudos to you because. We definitely do like, like Cole and I will like take shifts of like being on bungee duty like at holidays or whatnot like because she she needs someone to advocate her for her Um, and same thing with like other dogs like bungee like I I would consider her pretty good with other dogs but she likes other dogs to follow the rules and be respectful she's totally good with coexisting totally good um but she she doesn't like when other dogs don't listen to her when she says no and she doesn't like her space being invaded when she, when she's saying no or like you right. know when she doesn't want to play um <laughs> and that's that's <laughs> like super tricky which is also another reason why we started fostering because i wanted her to have experiences with dogs that followed our rules right that you have not that i'm like strict or anything but like that you have, you have, you can control her, that situation. The things that she needs, right? You know, so like when we get a foster, like the first thing we work on is like, I mean, you know, besides like sitting and all that stuff, is like settling together and like respecting space and like taking breaks. Um, and it always goes really good because they're learning the rule, you know, and they're learning how to communicate and work together. Like we've never one foster we didn't have long enough to really work together but like all the ones that we've had for a longer enough time they all work well because they all learned right Um, i i mean i I will say i did that i did that with peter and the cat because Mm -hmm. the cat he has a name but i just (laughs) call him the cat um (laughs) i did that with peter and huckleberry because peter wasn't super about the cat at first 
um, you know, coming in. He was he's great. He's a hundred percent great with people, with dogs, everything. And he's great with the cat now. But there was still like in the beginning that learning, you know, not to chase him every time he moves or, you know, this is his space and I need to kind of respect that space or when he's swatting at me I probably should back up but that idea of what you're what you're touching on the tandem relaxation shout out to up to snuff because awesome that's what um they helped us with um doing that tandem relaxation with Peter and the cat worked so well like I I mean I was like, wow, this is like, why have I not ever thought of doing this before? Because it, it, it does, again, it sets up that kind of predictability of this is what I need to be doing in the context of this other animal. And this is what I need to be doing in the context of this other animal. And I feel like in multi-dog households sometimes, that that's a that's not really a thought like yeah i'll teach them both to lay on their beds but that's different than ta- like actually relaxing in each other's space mm-hmm. i think sometimes too for a lot of people out there the idea of having to teach an animal to relax is new you know yeah. they just like we like we said in the beginning we think that our dogs come to us and they should be able to get in the car and go to the park and do all of these things. And we don't need to teach them that. They think we don't need to teach dogs to relax, but we do. Right. It's a skill. I mean, it's a skill, especially, you know, for rescue dogs that may have different. He's making his bed over there. He just wanted his moment. He wanted to be involved. <laughs> yeah, especially with like rescue dogs that maybe didn't have any good experiences ever with another dog being in a in a home or um, you know, in that kind of context. Or I don't know where I was going with that. Somebody <laughs> okay. distracted me over here. Still still making his bed. There we go. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. Karen. <laughs> I'm just, I, my brain is still caught on just the cat. I can't the get cat. past just continuing to refer to him as the cat. The cat. The cat. I'm so sorry. Yeah. But. No. It's okay. Huckleberry doesn't mind. All right. So I actually have, a, I'll actually segue this into a different, a different question. Um, so one of the things that Ashley, you wrote down that I thought was really cool being that you're not a professional yet, hint, 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 um, (laughs) that you're not a professional yet, but again, having that, that education background, so helpful and, you know, gives you a leg up, but for the reactivity piece turning training into play how do you think that because that's that concept is is not well understood by even professionals of the role and the power that play has for dogs especially with behavior issues how do you feel like that has helped your training, the the reactivity, or even just navigating your lives together? Um, So as far as, like, her reactivity specifically to, like, cars and dogs outside, um, I started off, not quite where I started off, but, like, leading up to our canoe trip last year, we did a lot of like parking lot training um, where like, you know, after we learned about leaving the house and getting in the car and do all that stuff calmly, 
um we would go out to like the far back corner of parking lots and just like look for a few minutes and then like drive to a different part in the parking lot and look for like not a few minutes like probably only like 20 seconds or something (laughs) something really small but like we did that for a long time and then we eventually would like get out and get back in and like we did that very gradually so that we could do like walks around the parking lot and she could do it but it wasn't like it wasn't it wasn't I don't really know how to describe it 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 got her kind of it it helped her but it didn't it didn't get her to be able to do it in a relaxed way naturally. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of thought about like clear what she needed to do in her life and whatnot. And like, she doesn't need to walk on the parking lots in heel. She does need to just like be okay being herself around serious things. Um, so then I kind of transitioned it more to going getting out of the car in the parking lot and going and walking around like a park on a long line and like bringing her ball and doing whatever sort of flowed naturally into our routine there. Um, So like, we'll carry the ball around. We'll do a little training. We'll go stand next to something and play that would be, you know, reaction inducing if we weren't engaged together. Um, And we kind of just like, I don't know like those training sessions are very fluid and they're very like relationship building and it just it made that those kinds of trips with her um made a bigger difference in her reactivity than like the focused work around triggers that are far away but like I don't know if that answered the question that's that's kind of like the biggest example of like training through play that I I can think of with us and so now like she can get out of the car in the parking lot that's near on a busy road we can walk into the park where there's soccer games sometimes there's horses galloping through the park Mm. (laughs) (laughs) random (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) but she did really good with them you know there's dogs watching sport games there's cars with headlights later on and like we're engaged together and she's having a good time. So she's not really the, the, the scared or the nervous feelings aren't in the forefront. She's learning hmm. to kind of like, I know you... yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh no, no. I was just wrapping it up. Slowly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I always love pointing people in the direction of um, play way. Forgive me. I don't remember who initiated it or came up with like the concept and all that stuff and it's it's a really beautiful way of just like connecting with your dog and it is so effective in building that relationship because when we just a quick example of how we've done it is when we moved into this house CJ had a big almost fenced in acre to run around and play on and then he only wanted to play outside and I was like it's negative 40 degrees outside I don't we're not doing that so I use the playway structure to teach him and bond with him and show him we can play inside and now more often than not he's like yeah let's let's play inside I don't want to go out it's cold uh (laughs) so it's it's really a beautiful way of communicating with your dog building that relationship and just like teaching them what you would like them to do instead the other the other thing I can I just thought about as far as um training through play is like when we when we first got her when I was like teaching her kind of like the basic um skills she I would kind of teach her earlier in the day um and then throughout the day <clears throat> and then when Cole got home he would take whatever skills that we had been working on and bring them in the backyard and incorporate them into like all the play that we were doing. So she got really good at like, it just sort of rounded out her whole understanding of these things that she's learning and they're fun. And there's like structure to her life. Um, 
and then on the other the other on the other side of that if like like she's a dog who had a lot of challenges so there was so much learning that was really important but you can't always be like it can't always be school you know (laughs) it's gotta be like you have to make it fun too and that's her like the training in the play right right and I think too a a lot a lot of the piece that's missing sometimes and you know like I said I think a lot of trainers especially newer trainers don't make the connection between what the brain is doing when it's playing And how that relates to, you know, working through what we would say as a behavior issue. I don't really feel like they're issues, but for for lack of better words. And so I feel like that's a big thing that's missing sometimes is that we overlook the power of that to be so effective in this communication and in this bonding that it's a piece that's missing in our behavior modification puzzle because we don't give it enough credit and and how powerful that it can be. Yeah, like I see how relaxed like Bungie is if we're working on desensitizing while we're playing versus like walking in the parking lot. Like she's calm there, but like she's more relaxed when we do it through play. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's huge. I love the fact that we're seeing more of that lately. I wish that we had a greater appreciation for that a long time ago. But um but yeah, I mean, I even you know, with my how I started as a trainer, I remember even for us training the canines that it wasn't we didn't really play with them right because they're just a tool they're just a tool and they worked you know they did their they did their shift and then they went back in their kennel and then you know we got the next day and yeah we you know we did some stuff with them and all of really the interaction the meaningful interaction with them came through the training and they're doing their job And so, yeah, you might spend a couple minutes like, you know, playing, tossing the ball or something, but not necessarily using play itself to, to, I guess, to enhance those things, right? So using play to increase your training using play to you know increase your your work and your proficiency at your work um i mean we always threw a toy reward but you know what one or two seconds of playing with it and then we're right back to work versus taking the time to really sit there and do that kind of bonding with with dogs that essentially basically are just tools and not bonded to humans that we would see like in a pet. I love that Peter's just like, I will be on this episode. <laughs> you will hear from me. Oh yeah, now he's like staring. He's staring at us now. Like, stop looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so that was basically a long way to say we don't pay enough attention to the power of play. There. I just zhuzhed it down into a nice little Bite size. <laughs> All right. Are we are we good to move on? Yes, Karen. Okay. okay. Yes. <laughs> well, I want to Okay. I want to jump into the big one. The big one here. And if Nicole is ready. I don't know if you I'll, had any other I'll do it. Do it. Okay. All right. Jump in. So we're obviously 
going to stumble into some waters that not everybody loves. Um, and like we will be saying, <laughs> I in, okay. like she's like, I get it in our intro that we will be recording about this. We are coming at this from a place of learning and understanding, and we are not going to be judgmental Judies. We are not going to be keyboard warriors. We are going to learn. We are going to listen. And we're going to have some fun with it, too. Because you explained to us that you do use an e-collar with Bungie. Oh, God, that name escaped me for a second there. My brain really really right, pulled yeah. through. I was like, oh. all of a sudden it was just gone. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. So what I, or I think both of us, were interested in hearing about is kind of how you came to the decision to incorporate the use of an e-collar into your training with Bungie. Well, First, oh, 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 first, okay. mm-hmm. full transparency, Ashley and I had a night. I mean, I feel like it was a nice little thing on email where, you know, you said, hey, this is this is where I'm coming from. And I don't want that to be a surprise. And, you know, it really I really hold on time out. <laughs> Peter is just like. Good, so I'm not the only one who had a timeout with a dog. <laughs> no, mine just happened to be on inside. They did not join me, so don't, or else they to be so good. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know this dog very well right here. <laughs> what I miss? What I miss? Oh, we were just saying that she's glad that she wasn't the only one that had a timeout because of a dog. <laughs> oh no, no, no. Um, yeah. So I mean, full transparency, like. I did have to really think about it and I really did have to kind of work through it with Karen because I, I feel that like as a professional tied to a pretty rigorous code of ethics for you know who I'm credentialed through and and my you know professional memberships and things that I I feel very strongly about this topic mm-hmm. but I also don't ever want a guardian to feel alienated about it or to feel like we don't still support them. And so, you know, we had kind of, Karen and I had kind of talked a little bit about, well, we'll just not go there. We'll just not go there and we'll not bring it up and we'll not talk about it. I we'll wonder why I'm talking about recalling a deaf dog in the woods off leash, right? Here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think that it speaks to a bigger conversation, not only between trainers and behavior professionals and guardians, but also within our own community that if I'm going to reserve judgment about this thing that I do feel strongly about, I don't want to put that on a guardian. I may have a back and forth with another trainer about it. But I don't ever want a a guardian who is doing what they feel is right to ever feel alienated about, you know, or because they, they do that or they've come to that decision. So I wanted to talk about that. Well, and I think part of the conversation we had, too, at least from what I was saying, is that I hate I hate how the conversations are always had I hate the you're wrong and I'm right which obviously I understand that 
like you said, we have these code of ethics. We train the way we train because that's how we train. But it's never a conversation, I find, when we talk about e-collars versus horse free. I find that it always quickly devolves. <sighs> quickly <laughs> dissolves <laughs> into hurling accusations or calling names. And for me, I remember I specifically said to you, Nicole, that we, what did I say to you? Oh my God. Um, I said... Well, I mean, I, I, I resemble that remark, right? Because I am I don't filter myself as much as I should, clearly. Um, and I will admit that. Um, it is a struggle. Um, but again, I I do see how that conversation does quickly get out of hand and my own part in that a lot of the times. And I for me, I feel like that comes from a place of deep passion and caring about not only, obviously, dogs and animals, but also what I bring to this profession. And but... I, I appreciate that. But then I feel <laughs> in the same breath, not to cut you off, but I bet I feel like because I'm not as vocal as other people that when that's said i don't care as much as you do and, and i know that's not the case I know oh that's no i don't case. feel yeah i don't feel that way at all but i feel like that's like it it just it's it's a conversation that needs to be had and it's a conversation that needs to be heard from both sides because i remembered what i said to you and that was that <laughs> we don't change this profession or this industry or this whatever by not listening to each other. Right. Because there are things that I can learn from people who use XYZ tools that we don't. And there are things that they can learn from me, but we're never going to learn those things if we're just screaming at each other saying, I'm right, you're wrong. So. Right. <laughs> now that we went that was that was karen that was, imparting her wisdom now that we because... just went we went way <laughs> left there <laughs> well, i think Back it's good you. though i mean i think it's good because again like like what you're saying i fully own my approach but I, I would not want to be on want... the end of your approach. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do I do want to move that conversation forward. And I think that happens with understanding guardians and where they were coming from. And one million what percent you're saying. Yeah, we can't like I can't ever help somebody through that or help myself understand that better if we aren't having these conversations because it would have been so easy to just be like well we're not going to talk to Ashley about it so but then we would have missed out on all this cool stuff so <laughs> and and I think I, I think <laughs> we have trainers and professional behavior people we all have to do better at being a little bit kinder because I'm, I I would I, I keep going I want to know how Ashley <laughs> came to the decision to incorporate Let's do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah so with adopting a deaf dog at first we thought like oh, okay we'll just keep her on leash and like we'll train her really well on leash and that'll be that um and she she can be good on leash but like she is a little dog with big feelings and she's a healer and she needs that she needs freedom to like to be okay and 
and yeah, yeah, we, she's, she's so good at learning. Like, she has she had she has the capacity for she had the capacity for good recall really quick it's just that she couldn't hear um so yeah coming to the e-collar it it seemed like the best way to give her the freedom that she needed and it wasn't like we didn't introduce her to it, it to her for months like we made sure all her cues were like spot on. We practiced like her recall was so good before we even showed her the the collar. Um, and then we never used it in like a punishment way. Which, I mean, as a guardian who sees all like the you know positive reinforcement only, like you know stuff that's out there on social media, like or. or you know other podcasts or whatnot it's it 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 feels weird um because it's always like e-collar equals punishment but we we never used it to punish her we taught that that you know that buzz meant look at us and then, like, follow our cue. So, like, most of the time, the buzz means to recall. Um, if we tap it once, it's like a, hey, look over here. You know, like a check-in to make sure. Because, like, with a deaf dog, if you recall them and you're far away and they forget which direction you are, they could run the opposite direction. Right. And I've had that happen with B. Like, we we run every day. Um, so she turned down, like, you know, one turn too early. And then I stopped on, like, the far side of that intersection. So I was only, like, six feet from her, right? <laughs> and then I recalled her, and she went running back. Where the way I <laughs> I'm like, eventually she turned around because she realized, like, I wasn't back there. But, like, um, now I feel like that was a tangent. Where was no. I? No. Nope. Um, right, no, because you like, can't – she can't hear you. The direction from which your voice is coming. Yeah, right. So we, um, so we use like one, a tap is like a, hey, just check in, make sure you know I'm over here. And then, um, to, to call her to us, we use touch as her, like her come, um, because it means she always comes back all the way. So if we hold it, then she comes back and touches. And then we also have like a, an encouraging, like, come on that's like her choice but you know if like we're trying to get her to swim across like a stream or something like she doesn't have to do something she's scared of but like come on you can, like, you can so do she it had, she's had a couple <laughs> different like types of cues there but like none of them were used as like a to punish her they were all used as like a you know like show her what to do right um I think that's a distinction, though, that can be missed because because a lot of times that line is very muddied. This is my my trepidation with it, is that if we're using it in both manners, which a lot of people do, then we can't possibly be conditioning it in that positive way. And so it's kind of like approaching a an intersection where tively conditioned, right? So green means go and being able to go is our reward. And then all of a sudden now green also means stop. Mm. And so we it's uh, it's creates a level of conf- I get it. And I've never actually thought about what you're saying with it. Um, but that's kind of like, you know, if your dog has bad recall, so you get an e-collar right. to make your e-collar better. Versus, yeah, our recall is solid. Now we can get you an e-collar to, to learn that so that you can be off leash because you can't hear. Right. Right. And yeah. I think a lot of, again, my, for me, the way that 
this is usually approached by other professionals is that it is used in both capacities. I want to give my dog freedom. And the way I do that is by stopping them running away. And that can be very confusing. And and I think, yeah, I think that's what I tend to see also, you know, from like a guardian point of view, looking at what's being said in like the training community or whatnot. And I actually, I listened to a podcast, I think sometime last year, about punishment. And it was talking a lot about e-collars. And afterwards, I'm like, maybe my understanding of it is just totally wrong and backwards but it doesn't feel like that so I reached out to them and asked them about like our situation like am I punishing my dog without realizing it and she actually wrote back and said no if I was in your case I would be doing the same thing yes but then why does everything that's said about it say that that's bad or wrong you know no I was just saying I was just thinking here listening to you too and I think what may be kind of the missing piece, and I'd be terribly wrong here because I'm not on that side of social media, but all we see on social media is the quote-unquote professionals using these tools to correct reactive and aggressive behaviors. And then we see people launching themselves at them, screaming at them, telling them that they are horrible people for doing these things. And then I would have to assume when just a quote unquote, just a guardian sees this person receiving all of this hate, they don't want to share their experiences. So then we don't hear as often from the people who are making use of these tools in a somewhat appropriate manner. I can't say appropriate completely (laughs) just because it's not what I It hurts. It hurts. I could tell. Uh, But, but what I think you, I think you know what, like I'm trying to say, like we don't hear these stories because People don't want to share them out of the fear of the backlash that they're going to receive. So I think it's right. important that we share. And I think, yeah, I think too, like for me, um, I always try to look at the person before I respond. If the person is a dog trainer, my response is very different. If the person is you, I'm going to be like, yeah, I'll have a conversation with you. I'm not going to try to make you feel bad or whatever for doing for doing something. But I do admittedly hold someone that calls themselves a professional to a higher standard. And I think that we should. So what if there was a professional though, in the same boat with a deaf dog, like, like, how is that? (laughs) I mean, if we can have a discussion about it and you can, you know what I mean? Like, that's what Karen's saying. Like, that's where it comes from. I have quite a few balanced people that I have regular DMS with and we have, wonderful discussions about you know trainings that they do not I wouldn't do it that way but we're able to have a conversation about it because there was enough common ground there I think Mm -hmm. for me to then be like well I'm not going to judge you for this and them being like well I'm not going to judge you because you don't and so I feel like you know I am more than willing and welcoming to people that want to learn and have a discussion. But I have a hard time personally. I have a hard time with somebody that doesn't understand the mechanisms by which that works and they're selling it to people as a fix. 
You know what I mean? They're, they're selling it as this will fix your dog. This will fix her reactivity. All you got to do is just zap, zap, zap every time she reacts. And that's what I have a problem with. Now, if that person was like, well, hey, no, this is how I'm doing it, then great. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk about, oh, you would do it that way. I might do it this way. But I think that that's, that's not what happens most of the time. You know what I mean? There isn't, they, they aren't doing it that way. Or they say, oh, I've positively conditioned it. But then they're using it as a punisher, which you, if you're doing both, you can do both. But if you're doing both, that's causing so much confusion and frustration that doesn't need to be there. I mean, especially for you, for having a deaf dog, if that tap meant check in with me, but let's say, you know, it's also getting a tap every time she, she barks at something or has a reaction, like we then can't rely on that tap to check in with me to have that same meaning. Right, right. And I also want to point out, because Karen's, we're losing Karen. It's almost Karen's bedtime. No, 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 but... no, 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 no. I was just, I was, go it's ahead. It's a running not... joke. It's a running joke. It, 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 it is. Um, no, you finish your thought, but I feel like that was not what I meant by my thought. So I just, I also want to say, though, to Ashley's point, you can be a compulsive aversive trainer without any tools at all you don't need a tool to be punishing you don't need a tool to suppress behavior and so I think that's also a big piece of this puzzle that's missing is that it's more it is more than just the tool and I try to remind myself of that often because I feel like there's bigger issues going on there yeah. <laughs> you both are like, no, you go. No, you go. No, go ahead. Go ahead. You can go, Karen. Oh, no, I just, all I meant by my point, and maybe you did get there and maybe it, it just went right over me, but I just meant that, like, we have, obviously, okay, there's people out there with large follower accounts. Follow, follow, follower counts. And so if somebody with just a dog, they just got a dog and they look up at this person and they see, maybe not just got a dog because you're not going to stick with that, this hypothetical situation, Nicole, you find the flaw in that. <laughs> okay. They've had a dog for a few months and they've just started using this tool and they're using it how Ashley's using it. But then they go on to this big, they see this big account who's using this tool and then getting all this hate for it. Then that person who just got the dog isn't going to want to share their experience. And so that's why I think we see such this, this huge divide because we're only seeing the negative and right. the fallout from for the person sharing that experience. So then we don't get to see that side of it. Right. So it's there's that divide again of we've forgotten how to talk to each other and just hear from both sides of the equation. And that's the that's the biggest issue for me that I just I just need to learn how to freaking talk to each other again. Because we're all in this together, right? We all just want to take our goddamn dog for a walk and enjoy it and be left alone, okay? So but that was what my point was. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I feel like it's, like, so divided, and you're either one or the other. Like, you know, I've been looking into going into to training um, and talking with Heidi about it. and. You know, I felt like because I use an e-collar for my deaf dog, like I'd have to be, you know, in the like balance field of it. And she's like, well, no, like everything you do is 
positive based, it doesn't have to be like so black or white. Like you can right. be a you know positive dog trainer who uses the collar for your dog. Um, I I don't know. Yeah, I feel like it's very polarized. And That's it a polite way to put it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I I wish that we had more people like you. Like, I feel like we need more of your, your type voices to bridge that gap for us. Because ultimately, the only reason why we have a job is because of you, because of guardians, because of dogs that need help. And so when we aren't listening to you, then why are we even here? Yeah. And like, I... I truly believe that, like, Bungie would be, like, a mess of behaviors if she didn't have that freedom. Uh, like, it's done wonders for her. And it's um, it, it's just a bummer that that kind of is looked at in such a negative light when it, it helps this dog. And I'm sure there's other dogs out there who, you know, have their own unique sense or, like, their own unique personality and struggles and things who could benefit from other things that, you know, might benefit from an e-collar too, or something that, you know, is looked down on. Yeah. And I think too, it's, it's on both sides because both things are looked down on because you get, the people on the balance side going well a harness is forcing your dog and so you're not really force free because you've got your dog on a leash and it's like or right or the your dog must never have any off-leash freedom because you don't use that and so like we both on both sides can make these assumptions and these sometimes outlandish accusations of like my favorite is well you're not really force free because you use a leash and I'm like I mean look you're not wrong like I get it like I get your point but like come on like we we don't need to be that like nitty gritty about what we're picking apart here Um, but it's just we have to I know I've said it and I will die on this hill I've said a thousand times tonight but we have to be able to talk to each other or else we will always live in black and white and our dogs will be the ones that ultimately lose out because we can't have a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I so, feel like, oh, go, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to um, ask um, Ashley one more question about this, her, or your and Bungie's journey into using the e-collar did you like did you get any outside help from that or was that all you know kind of like I've I feel like this is gonna help us or I mean we definitely researched but we didn't we haven't worked with a trainer so we did all of that ourselves I really think that, you know, again, I think that talking with more people like you is what's needed, really. Um, so thanks to Heidi <laughs> for saying, hey, you have got to talk to my friend, Ashley. And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> but no, I mean, I'm glad we did. And I'm glad that we did touch this topic i mean do you have any questions for us i'm glad you addressed that too because i feel like it's always like a thing that everyone avoids yeah well did you to karen's point too because you do have a page for bungee Mm -hmm. so i mean did you personally like on this journey with her like have you received any of that backlash personally um my husband does her page um but (laughs) 
that's his Instagram. <laughs> but um, uh, no, I mean, it, we don't like. You know, she doesn't have like a big following or anything. It's more to share with like friends. Um, so we haven't received any negative feedback about it. But it's always kind of, you know, in a, a back of mind, like, right. you know, people judge about those things. Do yeah. yourself so a like favor and stay small. That. Yeah. What was that? Oh, I was just saying, do yourself a favor and stay a small account. Not not just for like the what you use, but just in general. Just yeah. it's so much easier. Keep keep it small. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because no matter what, somebody's angry at you. No matter what. Right. <laughs> and I'll admit, it's probably me. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. Karen knows that I'm trying so hard to be better. Oh, Nicole, are you sure? No. Are you sure that's what you want to say? <laughs> I do. I'm very. I'm very passionate about things. But I mean, again, I mean, I feel like just talking to you about this has made me feel better and made me, you know, think if nothing else about how I can approach somebody else like, like you in the future. Um, not that I'm training anymore, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's an important topic because it is so, it is so polarizing, but it is so prevalent with the rise of social media. Karen's yeah. like, yeah, let's just social media. I hate it so much. <laughs> I know <laughs> it's a necessary evil for you, though. <laughs> it's the worst. <laughs> but no, I love all of my followers. Please don't unfollow me. You guys are the best. <laughs> social media is still the worst. <laughs> but good. I mean, but with that being said, if you want. How can our listeners find you, follow you, get in touch with you? You don't have to share if you don't want to. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Oh, I do have Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and so does Bungie. <laughs> yeah, Bungie is uh, Bungie the Blue Dog. And my social media, which I use for my art mostly although I which is amazing by the way oh yeah it's stunning. <laughs> thanks um is uh stony brook studios nice yeah i mean i've really enjoyed this um a lot getting to understand like where you're coming from and all of the things that you have done to better like you know, you are in Bungie's relationship and better Bungie's world. And yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad we got to talk to you today. Yeah, you guys too. Awesome. All right, Karen, Jeez. take us home. All right, everybody. <laughs> well, we hope you enjoyed this conversation. And please don't forget to give your dog a biscuit from us. Until next time. <laughs>